thank you. Thank you, Final Vision, for your songs gracing us all with that presence, the beautiful, soft, gentle presence of God's grace, God's love. Well, it's great to be back with everybody, to see all your smiling faces again. I just always love looking at all the faces and hugs and waves and yeah, it's such an intimate journey. Such an intimate journey that we have here and we go in together and uh, I always enjoy uh, these sessions too where we can can be very interactive because you have such light to shine and share and uh, and your hearts, I, I feel them so much whenever I, I read through the the questions and prayers for these online retreats. It's, it's quite a, an experience just to be with the words that you write in and to really take them inward into prayer and feeling what would be most helpful because your prayers and your questions actually bless everyone that we're all on this journey together and everything we share blesses everyone. Every question we have is a blessing and every prayer that we offer is a huge blessing for the entire universe. So I mentioned a few uh, names uh, the last time I was on and uh, I've got my course book, my workbook and my text here and I thought we could, uh, could use this time to really interact together and uh, and dive deeper together into this holy instant experience. This is truly for us, I think, a new beginning because you're now you're turning toward the light and you're turning your devotions toward the answer, toward the holy instant, and away from the questions of the world, the comparisons of the world. You're turning away from the distractions of the world and the values of this world. The world is always telling us bigger, better, faster, more, and you're, you're more happy to be content and rest in God than going for bigger, better, faster, more. Uh, and that's a very important turn in your mind. When you're turning to the Holy Instant, you're turning to this inner rest and this inner grace. So I thought I would start out today with uh, something that uh, Stephanie uh, wrote in, and uh, so maybe we can get Stephanie on the screen, and I will read what Stephanie wrote, and we'll all use this as a way of, uh, of diving in. I think I just saw Stephanie on the, the one before on the right-hand side there. There she is. She's waving. She put her hand up there. She wrote, now it is the time to look at my belief, I am bound, and let it go. I feel this is a big one. Everywhere I go, I see obligations and commitments and also the fear of consequence when I don't behave accordingly. I know freedom is not from this world. I am perhaps, I say, surprised how much that prison I had built gave me security and safety. That is how it truly felt. And now those bricks are falling. It is a little bit scary. I want to take this into this retreat. I want to let go of my belief that I am bound. And I add the prayer of today's lesson Lesson 278, Father, I ask for nothing but the truth. I have had many foolish thoughts about myself and my creation and have brought a dream of fear into my mind. Today, I would not dream. I choose the way to you instead of madness and instead of fear. For truth is safe 
and only love is sure. The prayer of my heart is trust. Not only hear and listen to the guidance, but I want to trust and follow the guidance. I want to trust that everything is planned by one whose only purpose is my good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Kisses and love. So that's beautiful, Stephanie. I thought we could explore that because what we've been looking at in this retreat is really that the holy instant and the truth offers everything and everything else that we've ever believed, every concept we've ever held, every decision we've ever made to struggle and survive, uh, which we all have, have done as human beings, everything has, is being shown to us as being a, a cover over this uh, truth. And the belief that we're bound, you know, bound is a sense of, of imprisonment. And I think while some of us may have felt physically held back by limitations in this world, by the world's uh, laws and um, by its structures and its uh, rigid norms and mores and so on and so forth, I think we're all getting closer to that point where we see that the ego itself, the belief that we're separate from God, is what the imprisonment is. It's, it's in our mind and the world is just reflecting our belief in this ego. And I, I really sensed your sincere prayer was not only to be aware of the guidance, but to, to really follow it. And what happens when you start to feel those nudges and those prompts and those, those little guidances coming through, then the ego is quite threatened and will get stirred up uh, like a hornet's nest. What are you doing? What are you you're throwing everything away that you've worked for? You're, everything that you've, you've got to protect you in this world, you're starting to question and basically uh, very much like in the Revolver movie where the ego tries to, to scare Jake Green by saying, you know, I'm all you've got. It's us against them and uh, trying to scare Jake into uh, get back with the world's program and, and don't get too... Uh, too inspired here <laughs> by the Spirit, because it's, uh, ego saying, it's pretty dangerous to follow all this uh, spiritual woo-woo and la-la land stuff, uh, you know, get back to the basics of um, practicality in the world. So, yeah, from your experience of what we've shared last night and today, maybe you could share a little bit of, of how is it that you experience this sense of being bound. What, how, how is it in terms of the feelings you experience and some of the, the thoughts that typically uh, go through your mind? And maybe also you can share a little bit about what does it mean the bricks are beginning to fall? <laughs> how is that experience for you? Because many people probably can relate to what you're talking about. <laughs> Wait. The bounds are like um, hello first at all. <laughs> Perhaps the bounds is like um, it's not. Nothing seems mm. like it has has been before, like in some way. Um, it's, it's perhaps uh, questioning situations. Um, um, and things I did have no more, the, I'm not more, no more interested in. 
and it's like an emptiness somehow. Uh, I'm not quite sure how it will fill up. It's a, an emptiness. Um, Yeah, that's a good starting point. That's a good starting point. Because mm. <laughs> I feel mm. like um, that when you start to make the turn in your mind this way, then um, it can feel like an emptiness feeling can just wash over you like, uh, oh, what is this? What will become of me? Uh, in one sense, you're letting go of the past and what's been familiar, and yet not having quite clicked into the fullness of maybe your, I call it your function of uh, being in alignment with God. So the, the joy factor hasn't reached its, uh, its full, you know, your meter is still climbing, but it hasn't really clicked all the way over there. And so there's that emptiness feeling in the sense that you're kind of in between, you're in a, a transition there. And um, I think you're just starting to come to like an honesty of seeing that what all of these make-believe ideas and this make-believe identity has, has had a lot of, of guilt along with it, a lot of, you mentioned um, obligations, commitments, um, you know, you can feel quite tied down, and a lot of people feel very stressed out. They, they bought the bait of the ego for this sense of security and safety in terms of the world. Uh, investments, money in the bank, a house, a roof over your, your head. Uh, even, even in terms of people, we can feel quite comfortable in, oh, I've got my family watching out over me. I'm not all alone in this world. I have these protections that, that guard me against uh, loneliness or against uh, being disconnected. And yet, when you go through this spiritual awakening, uh, a lot of these pursuits and desires uh, start to fall away. And in terms of obligations and commitments, it's like, uh, it's more like that gets flipped around too, like you're obligated to know who you really are. You need to commit to the correction in your mind. You need to commit to the healing in your mind, to the restoration of your mind. And so you're making that commitment, but it's a little strange because the ego is like, what you're letting go of all your mind energy and all the commitments in terms of the world. And it feels like you're just, emptying out everything and there's going to be nothing left of you if you keep uh, emptying everything out. So this is very typical and I'm glad you are bringing this up because, because when you make this turn, you, you do have to have a lot of faith. I mean, I know when I was in education, university for 10 years, I was making a commitment to co complete my degrees to do all my assignments, to be on all the projects and committees I was to be on, and so on and so forth. And it took actually quite a commitment, I thought, to stay in university for 10 years full time. And yet, when I came out, it was like the spirit inside me, Jesus was saying, okay, now I'd like you to learn to commit to have faith in me, uh, to follow my guidance, the same effort that you put into reading all those books and writing those papers and taking those exams and doing those projects, I want you to give me that same commitment and that same devotion to let me use you for a while. Uh, let your body be like a puppet uh, for me to a channel to, to express uh, my love, uh, to allow my clarity to come through you. Let me choose your words. Uh, let me direct and guide the way and let me take care of you instead of you taking care of you with your little bank accounts and your little credit cards and so forth. Let me provide for you 
who are doing a great service to, to everyone and to the Spirit by your devotion. So, I think that is the way to, to find true freedom is to start to realize we are developing faith. Just like if you went to the gym to do workouts and you were developing your muscles to have a stronger body, it's almost like we have this uh, ability to have faith in a higher guidance, a higher wisdom, a higher intelligence, but we have to exercise that faith time and time again, day after day, for the faith to grow strong and, and to show us that we are sustained by this invisible presence and force. It's not visible to our, our body's eyes and we can't always perceive it through our five senses, but it's really there and it's, it's very, very strong and it really wants us to know it. <laughs> and, and that's why we're all brought together. And I appreciate too that you just all the online uh, retreats that you've been on and the way that you've been linking in with Mighty Companions because I, I sensed from my visits over there to see you in Europe, but also uh, from the idea with these Mighty Companions that we're all walking on this journey together. And, and sometimes it helps to have the encouragement of those that have walked along this path or are walking along this path right now and need to feel that we're walking hand in hand and arm in arm um, because it can get quite perplexing and confusing to the ego. The ego is suspicious of this whole awakening. It feels like it's going to uh, be obliterated uh, by this if it, if it continues. It feels like it will be gone, and in one sense, uh, it's right about that. Uh, but it, but it, it, it thinks of it as death. This is all leading to death uh, instead of eternal life. It doesn't even believe there is such a thing <laughs> as eternal life. So, I just want you to know that we're all with you, and uh, and the freedom that you seek, I feel, is you're on the right direction when you're wanting to listen and follow the guidance, because. In my experience, that is, the, that is the sure, safe way to true, authentic freedom. It's freedom of mind. It's not really freedom of the body to do whatever the body wants to do, but it's, it's peace of mind and it's, it's a free spirit. It's knowing our free will in God, in God's will. And, and I just thank you for hanging in there with us and uh, we feel your love and your sincerity and we really feel your heart in, in that question too. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Stephanie. Also, um, Esther from Pennsylvania wrote, I was guided to read the rules for decision. <laughs> Jeffrey's hands are going up here. Jeffrey in the studio here is a big fan. He was so thrilled with your <laughs> what you wrote. He loves the rules for decision. You said, I would, was guided to read the rules for decision and would be happy to have you go over them. I am trying to discern and decide which voice I am hearing to follow, while too knowing the only choice is one of purpose and still having this strange feeling when I do not do the specific action that guidance suggested. Along comes a time of doubt that the choice made affects my future from a simple decision not to use that bowl versus the other one the loud, unquestionable voice had said to use. Please help or tell me which way this sort of thing gets it healed. It could be uh, covered. Thank you and blessings of love. So I thought um, this is a great uh, opportunity for all of us because all of us are opening to the holy instant, but we need some uh, we need some guidance to be pointed in that direction to really stay focused in the moment. And really, that means stay aligned with the love. That's what moving. To towards the Holy, 
holy instant. Bringing the holy instant into our awareness means to really tune in and align with that love. And most everybody can relate to the idea that every single day there seem to be a lot of decisions to be made as you move through time and space as a human being. So Esther has asked us about the rules for decision and some of you who are familiar with that know that it's it's back in chapter 30 of the text. And interestingly enough, the chapter is titled, The New Beginning. And I feel like all of us in this retreat, we are, uh, we are like holy instant subscribers. We're going to subscribe. We're, we're attempting to subscribe fully to the holy instant. We're attempting to immerse fully into the holy instant. And for all of us this weekend, I would say our opening to the holy instant is definitely a good phrase would be the new beginning. Because we're wanting to shift from dreams of judgment to forgiving dreams and, and happy dreams instead of painful and fearful dreams. So, I will go through the rules for decision here briefly because I feel like this will be a great benefit to all of us in opening to the Holy Instant. Because it's, it's using the context of decisions. And I think everybody can relate to this because everybody knows that you seem to have decisions that you make and it might be good to have a context from the Spirit to understand the importance of, of decision making. In heaven there are no decisions, but in terms of unraveling from the ego and unbinding yourself from the ego's beliefs and laws, decision making is, is the central mechanism for doing that. It starts out, rules for decision. Decisions are continuous. You do not always know when you are making them. Wow, what a, what a first <laughs> couple sentences. Decisions are continuous. That seems to go against our, our human experience uh, that they're continuous because we feel we make them from time to time, but we aren't aware that they're continuous. You do not always know when you are making them. The reason this is so is the unconscious mind that, that when we have decisions that we've already made, but they're out of awareness, they're pushed out of awareness, those decisions go by a different name than decisions. Decisions are conclusions, and decisions actually when they're pushed out of awareness are beliefs. So that's kind of an interesting idea that decisions that are pushed out of awareness are these unconscious beliefs and assumptions and conclusions. But with a little practice, the ones you recognize, a set begins to form which she's, sees you through the rest. It is not wise to let yourself become preoccupied with every step you take. The proper set adopted consciously each time you wake will put you well ahead. And if you find resistance strong and dedication weak, you are not ready. Do not fight yourself. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is telling us to be gentle with ourselves even when we have resistance to the guidance or resistance to our intuitive uh, apparatus, the, the, the spirit is nudging us in the, the way that would be most helpful. If we're not ready, do not fight yourself. But think about the kind of day you want and tell yourself there is a way in which this very day can happen just like that. So this is helpful for all of us in the sense it's, it's very proactive. You start off the day just thinking about the kind of day that you want. You can Think about the feelings you'd like to have, the experiences you'd like to have, and, and then you are given an opportunity to go ahead and try to have the day that you actually want. Try again to have the day that you want. 
The outlook starts with this. Today I will make no decisions by myself. So this is where the surrender to guidance comes in. When you say, today I will make no decisions by myself, you are literally saying, Spirit, you lead me, you guide me, you nudge me in the right direction, you light the way for me, you show the way, give me signs, give me symbols, give me a, a way that is clear and clean cut and obvious so that I do not drift off into a sense of a problem or a, a doubt uh, or a sense of a, of a challenge or a conflict. Help keep me on the right-minded path today. Today I will make no decisions by myself. And it is important to realize, he says, this means that you are choosing not to be the judge of what to do. But it must also mean you will not judge the situations where you will be called upon to make response. So, it's like a two-part thing. First of all, you're not trying to judge what to do. You're basically saying, Holy Spirit, my life is, is a blank canvas and you've got the paint set today and you just splash those colors out any way that you want to. I'm just going to enjoy the painting uh, that you paint today that my life is going to be a picture of my love and, and you be the one that, that, that wields the paintbrushes. You splash on those, those paints and those colors and I, I'm going to be told what to say and do today. But also, I will not judge the situations where I will be called upon to make response because Typically, that's where we get into the biggest problems. We already have these stereotypical views of people, places, situations, and we already think we know who they are, what they want from us, what they're doing, and, and we have pre-decided, based on our beliefs and thoughts, how we should uh, interpret. And actually, the Holy Spirit wants us to flow through the day uh, releasing interpretations, not, not continuing to pile them on top of each other. Because that, that really uh, can get you in a tizzy. For if you judge them, you have set the rules for how you should react to them. And then another answer cannot but produce confusion and uncertainty and fear. So if you already have judged the situations, if you already judged your day and you think, well, this is what I have to do, I have to perform these actions, I have to do these different things, and you don't have that openness to be used by the Spirit, then actually that's when the, the troubles and the difficulties come in. Because uh, when you do get a nudge from the Spirit and you're sure that you've already got the answer and you've already got your own direction, then you're going to feel confused at that point. And the confusion is really coming from self-doubt. It's still coming from uh, trying to listen to two teachers, to try to serve two masters, and that's where all confusion comes in. Because the Holy Spirit and the ego don't teach the same lesson, and they don't have the same curriculum, and they don't offer the same guidance. So that's where the confusion is coming in. This is your major problem now. You still make up your mind and then decide to ask what you should do. And what you hear may not resolve the problem as you saw it first. So when you make up your mind already and then you hear a prompt from the Holy Spirit, this is where the, the confusion comes in. This leads to fear because it contradicts what you perceive and so you feel attacked. So, this is slipping away from that devotional attempt to let the Holy Spirit guide. Uh, I always think that one of the prayers that I always liked the most was, uh, Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. When I'm in that place of humbleness and humility, then not surprisingly, the day flows amazingly and, and beautifully. And when there is a sense of agenda, 
coming in, then that's where the, the struggles start, as soon as that agenda gets activated. There are rules by which this will not happen, but it does occur at first while you are learning how to hear. Throughout the day, at any time you think of it and have a quiet moment of reflection, tell yourself again the kind of day you want, the feeling you would have, the things you want to happen to you, and the things you would experience, and say, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. So, what he's saying here is if you want to drop down into the, toward the holy instant and really embrace it, you need to practice and be habitually in the state of mind of, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. Habitually in a place like with your hands wide open, your ears open to listen, your heart open to receive. Because when we come from an agenda, we are coming from an ego self-concept and, and we're coming from that pride. And when we do have that pride, that's where the anger can come up because it's like the situations, the people, the things are not going the way that we have prejudged that they should go. And as we go on, I'm going to drop down a little bit to some of the key highlights of these because um, basically if you stay with the first two aspects of the Rules for Decision, you will stay in the simplicity of the Rules for Decision. And it's almost like instead of trying to follow the Ten Commandments, if you go, oh, I remember the first two, they're pretty important. If I could just keep loving God and loving my neighbor as myself, I think I'd do pretty good. Even if I forget the other eight, I'll do pretty good with those first two. It's the same with the rules for decision. If you can just remember the first two, and you're not even concerned about three, four, five, six, seven, you're just actually really excited about the first two, you're going to do real well if you can just stay with the first two. You don't even need the rest if you can remember the first two. And what are those two things? Remember, decide the kind of day that you want. That's pretty simple. You know, fill in the blank. Happy, joyful, loving, peaceful, free-flowing, spontaneous. You know, you can fill in the blank with your words, whatever you want. Just, just decide the kind of day you want. That's number one. And just remember number two. Always remember <laughs> number two. Because that's how you're going to do it. That's how you're going to achieve it, is, is the means is in number two. Decide that if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. Guaranteed. You're guaranteed a happy day if you just remember that you want a happy day and you aren't going to make any decisions by yourself. You're going to be very prayerful, receptive. Just show me, Lord. I will step back and let let you lead the way. I'm not going to try to interfere here today. It's too important for me to be happy. I'm not going to interfere. I'm not going to interfere with this. It's too important. And those are the one, two, that's the procedure. Those are the most important things to remember. And then, briefly, <laughs> if you, uh, if you seem to slip off of the number one and two and you forget, you forget that, then you have a way to kind of come back, a, rest a restorative, and that is um, what number three is all about. This is like your, your corrective device, and you know that if you've slipped off the beam somehow, and you're not having a happy day or a joyful day, and you don't feel really good, then you must have made a decision by yourself. That's, you know, you must have said, no, I'm taking over the reins here. <laughs> I'm taking these reins back. I'm going to make the decision on my own. Uh, Holy Spirit, you stay out of this. I'm, I'm taking charge here. That's not going to bring the, the peaceful, loving 
joyful, happy day. Here's your restorative, though. I have no question. I forgot what to decide. And what this means is, is that you quickly are going to come back into alignment, uh, not by trying to ask a question by yourself, but to come back to, this is the kind of day that I want and I won't make any decisions by myself. As soon as we start to question, uh, we start to analyze, we start to prioritize, we start to fix, we start to try to figure out we've gone off the path. We've, we've slipped away from our, our one and our number two. And now we need help. And this is the, the solution very quickly is I, I have no question. I forgot what to decide. And what it is, it's like a reset button. It cancels out the terms that you have set and lets the answer show you what the question must have really been. And uh, people often ask me, um, they say it's a little bit vague. You know, I, I do get into questioning. I, I have a very questioning mind and I'm going along the day and it's quite common for me to start to question what's going on here? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Uh, it's this analytical mind that starts to question, but, but it's confusing because they think, I don't know, I, I, I was trying to just follow the first two, but I got this questioning mechanism going in my mind. And to make it simple for you, I can tell you what that, the ego's question is that's got you all stirred up. I can give you the secret of what's underneath all those questions that the ego asks. To sabotage your happy day, the ego has a question and it takes many forms, but I'm going to give you what it really means so you'll be able to understand the content underneath all these different forms. Because it's easy to get tricked with all of the complexities. The ego says, oh no, these are good questions. These are a part of being a mature functioning adult human being. You better ask these questions. You have better be critical and so forth. No, no. The question that's underneath all of the ego's many questions is this. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? That's, the, that's what's the killer underneath. As long as you keep looking outside and trying to pick among the illusions and say, which of these illusions do I prefer? Which of these illusions will bring me a happy day? You know what the answer is? Zero. <laughs> There's not a single illusion that will bring you a happy day, but the ego doesn't want you to know that. It wants you to keep chasing among all these illusions, chasing, chasing like a cat, chasing its tail. He wants you to just chase and chase and chase and chase and forget your happy day, forget your peaceful day and get caught up in, in the sideshow, in this giant distraction. And that's where people kind of fall off the alignment without even knowing. They think it's like that Paul Simon song, slip sliding away. The no, you know, the nearer your destination, the more you're slip sliding away. The nearer your destination, if your destination is an illusion, an outcome of this world, and you're pursuing this outcome, you are slip sliding away from your real purpose of forgiveness. You are slip sliding away from your happiness from your peace of mind and your joy. So this is, these are like really prime lessons, Esther, that you are drawing forth here from Rules for Decisions, because if you really practice this and you understand how the ego is trying to sabotage you and have you not have a happy day, you're going to get wise. You're actually going to get wise to this when it tries to, to trick you and lead you off into being right about something or or taking a stance against somebody and, and holding on to a right stance as, as opposed to theirs. Those are all the ways that the ego uh, tricks you. And then it also tells you that if, you, if you're not able to just say, I have no question, I forgot what to decide, the next thing, you have to kind of 
pave your way to get back to the alignment. And once you have decided you don't like the way that you feel, what could be easier to continue with? And so I hope I have been wrong. And this, I remember in the early years in the 1990s, I did a whole teaching session and the title of the teaching session was Better Off If I Was Wrong. <laughs> because, because that humbleness will get you back into alignment with God in a hurry. It's, it's the persistence and the insistence that I am right about a situation or I am right about a person or about the way things should go that keeps us spinning and keeps us wavering. And when we admit and, and this is just the first step in admitting that you were wrong, is saying, I hope that I have been wrong. I don't like how I feel, so I hope I've been wrong. So that's a beautiful restorative. This Jesus has given you the way to zoom back into your right mind. And then you follow that up with, I want another way to look at this. Even if you're still resisting and you still are pretty sure you'd rather be right, um, that's like a crack, a crack in the mind for a beam of light to come through. And then finally, number seven is, perhaps there is another way to look at this. What can I lose by asking? At least you're willing to ask for help to see this situation differently, to see this brother, this sister differently. You have a little crack of an opening there. And that little crack is going to be what saves the day for you? Because the Bible said, don't go to bed angry. And the way that you don't go to bed angry is, is to have this crack of willingness to say, I hope I've been wrong. I was better off, I would be better off if I was wrong. And perhaps there is another way to look at this. What can I lose by asking? So those are, it's kind of a brief uh, summary that you asked for, Esther, was those rules for decision. And, and what I can say to you is, if you practice these rules for decisions, you're going to find that it's going to get easier and easier to have a happy day. Because the more surrendered you become, the more in service you become, the more devotional to God you become, uh, it's like, you'll be carried down a quiet path in summer. It's, it's as easy and as right as breathing, Jesus says. But it, it does take the willingness and the faith to keep going in this direction. Because the ego oftentimes doesn't want to give up so easy. It's like, not so fast. Uh, I, you're not getting out of my grip so fast. But if you're persistent and you keep practicing, and you keep remembering how worthy you are of love, and that you are love, then that's just going to strengthen that in your mind every single time you're able to do that. And I have faith in you, Esther. I, I know how you've hung in there. You've been persistent ever since I met you on the East Coast, and you had that sparkle in your eye, and I thought, She's, she's going to go for this. She's not going to mess around with this ego thing. <laughs> she's going she's gonna to go for this. You deserve to, to find that happiness. And, and I'm so glad you brought up rules for decision for everybody because you just are bringing the blessing to all of us by your prayer. And it was a beautiful prayer. So thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to now to just um, to open it up. We we've been I've been starting off from uh, what's been written in, but I after that session we had yesterday with those uh, those movie clips from Contact, and we were all so revved up and ready for expansion. I would like to see if uh, there's any hands going up or anyone that has would like to share an experience or or have, uh, has a question or a, something that's on your mind and your heart right now that you'd like to address in this very moment with everyone present. So let's take a look and see if we've got any, any hands going up or anybody has something they'd like to 
Share from their heart. Jerry has had his hands up for quite some time, so go ahead, Jerry. Um, last night, uh, can you hear me now? Can yes. You hear me okay. All right. So last night, after um, seeing the contact uh, piece, uh, it stirred me. I, as I'm sure with everyone, the, the feeling that, that comes up, which it was meant to do. Uh, I've been having a problem um, with, uh, I've been feeling like a zombie, basically. I've had lethargy and I've just been, uh, I've been walking around like you know, walking dead. Uh, and I've gone to the doctor, they removed a parathyroid a month ago and said, oh, you're going to feel so much better and all that. And, I, and I've had all these tests and everything, and they say, oh, your body's fine. Nothing's wrong. All of my tests are perfectly normal. And, and, I'm, and I have no enthusiasm. I have no, none of that. And uh, last night as the stirring came from that, just the little bit, just that little bit of feeling, I realized that what was going on is that my wife has stage four cancer. And we've been dealing with it for 10 years and the tests are, are coming out fine. They, you know, you have your ups and downs. And I realized that the, with the late, latest one, you know, I watch her every day get up and she's in pain and she limps around and everything. I was raised to be stoic. Uh, in my family, when you saw something like that, you got scared and then you got angry. And so I learned to be the rock and, and I, it served me very well in my life, you know, in terms of being the rock for other people. But this rock has turned into, at this point, I realize now what it's done with me with, in this situation is it's just cut me off from everything. And I'm just walking around with, with, uh, this going on and last night after that I realized that everything that was going on with me was fear just total fear and I went down and I talked to my wife about it and I didn't want to lay anything on her but I needed to just tell her what was going on and she said well you know that's not love and I said yeah I know it's not it's just fear, and but I'd rather feel, rather than be in my head with all the words and all of that, uh, I'd rather be in my heart and feel this fear and feel the sadness and feel alive than what I was not feeling. And uh, I raised my hand when the other lady earlier was on because it, it reminded me of it, uh, that uh, this, this um, the course of uh, love says, you know, it talks about the wholeheartedness of the mind with the heart. And, and my heart isn't open. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my heart being open. And I, I, you probably can hear it now in me uh, that that's the place I feel like I need to go but it's from a, a, a very difficult place to be because uh, as a man who's raised to be stoic and all that, uh, it feels yeah, out of control. It feels very difficult, yeah. but I'm, I feel like that's, I've got to be there because I'd rather be there than in that state of lethargy, zombieism than I was. And, I don't have anything more to share there other than I realized that, you know, here I study the course. I'm, I'm, I, I do the, the decision making in the morning about going, uh, you know, asking for the day I want, but it's all from my mind. I ha it's, it's got to have come from my heart to that, that heart part that it mentioned in there. And that's the part I've been missing because I'm so scared. And I guess it's a, still a lack of faith. You know, I'm not so scared of my own death. 
or you know the loss of this body uh, but uh when i'm seeing it in, the, in my beloved oh thank you jerry yeah i feel like this is a very important point that you're making that that uh that's how things work when we we make a decision maybe even at a young age that we're going to be strong and that means to be stoic and that means not to show weakness or sh not to show vulnerability or or show that we have uh, all these intense emotions. I mean, we know that, that the animals all have emotions and, and human beings have emotions and children even have a lot of emotions even though children are told, you know, you know it's better to be uh, seen and not heard and, and, and to oftentimes to stuff it down like, we don't want to hear that right now, we don't want to hear that we don't want to hear what you're feeling and so forth. So it's, it's part of a, a blockage. It's, a, it's part of a, a stuffing down uh, of when the emotions start to come up. But I'm so glad that you shared that you, how moved and touched you were with uh, those contact uh, clips that we saw last night because uh, they were very, Jodie Foster was very emotional and, and um, even in that movie, come being an astronaut and kind of supposed to control her emotions and be very logical and rational, she just was having experiences that were way beyond anything that she was supposed to feel. And, and I, that's part of the reason I played it, and I'm so glad that you picked up on that because I, I just want you to give yourself full permission to feel all these feelings, to be able to cry, to realize that um, being stoic doesn't help our spiritual journey because it we lose touch with our desire that Lisa was talking about, how strong that desire can be when we're in touch with it. But if we're not in touch with it, then it does seem to be like we're the walking dead. We're just uh, going through the motions and, and fulfilling our requirements and doing our duties and obligations, but, but not feeling uh, anything at all. Uh, it's almost like a deadness where we block out the joy and the happiness while we're trying to block out the pain and the hurt too. Almost like a painkiller, you know, how it just kind of numbs you. It blocks your receptors um, as, as how those uh, painkillers work. And it's very much, we're, we have to start to be honest and we have to let those emotions up. So thank you for, ev your, for all of us for sharing that because I know there are those that are watching and they're in similar situations, maybe not with a a partner who has stage four cancer for all these years, but maybe with, with a child that they're taking care of or uh, people that they're living with that are going through some extreme cases and they're trying to balance things out in the family and not rock the boat and keep the ship afloat, but there's, it's taking an emotional toll uh, on their spiritual awakening and, and you're giving them permission to start to question that. It's beautiful. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for raising your hand. Ah, oh, it's precious. Anybody else? Jeff, do you see any other hands? I do. Um, Bridget, uh, I, we thought we saw you waving your hand. Did you have some, a question? Not a question. Um, uh -huh. just, an ex just an experience. Um, well, a question as well, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I've had, um, I've suffered from extreme depression for the last few years, well, for the last 10 years. Um, and gradually I started to come out of certain aspects. I started to come out of it at work where I changed my mind about how I was going to um, see things. Um, and it changed my experience at work, but at home, my experience was I had to make my children happy. Um, two of my children have since left the house. One of my sons is still living here. Um, and I was adamant. I didn't even realize that I was, that was still in my mind after all the years. And I used to think when I'm feeling better, then Stephen will feel better. He slunk, he slipped into a, a malaise, a depression. And then he went into a phase where he didn't want to know what I wanted, what I was about. 
and he was going to do his own thing and he started a marketing business. Um, but I could tell it to me, the word antichrist came into my mind because he wasn't coming from a place of happiness to that. He was looking for his happiness in the business, in that alternative. Um, and I didn't know what to do. Um, and I prayed and um, eventually Stephen moved out for a few months, couldn't make it on his own and he moved back in. And I didn't know, I wasn't looking forward to him coming back at all. And I prayed and I got the, the um, guidance um, to leave Stephen B for now and focus on me and focus on what I was believing. So when I come home from work each night, I'd say hello to Stephen and then I'd maybe have something to eat with him sometimes awkwardly or on my own sometimes not awkwardly. And then I'd go up to the bedroom and I've been doing that for about nine months and just not, I've stopped, I have no television. Well, I have got a television, but it's not, I have no license to watch it any longer. So there's no escape into like television screens or into computers for to watch films or anything. It's like me face to face with myself. And um, in the silence, I've received such valuable information and I'm implementing this, but it's difficult because my mind is so um, set on a certain pattern and I have to, I'm breaking the, but I am breaking those patterns. Um, and one, one day I got home from work and I remember Stephen was out and I remember feeling really distraught and thinking, because of the way I've thought for the last 11 years, I've made him the way he is. And I was really, really distraught, I thought. And now I'm changing and I'm hanging him out to dry. <laughs> And I felt really bad. And I prayed. And I got the guidance that I was seeing him wrong. I was seeing him as this weak young man. And I, he, that isn't who he is. And I have to learn to look past that and to sort of see his strength and to see my own strength oh that's beautiful that's beautiful bridget because it's like you've been seeing him through yourself through the mother filter and him through the son filter and and it's like the spirit is wanting to pull away to clear all those filters to just see as we just read in rules for decision to see it differently to see it anew and to see also in terms of decisions that you can't blame yourself for anything that you've said or done because you were doing the best that you could based on your belief system. And so with Steve, Stephen, and now it's, you're starting to realize there is a way to see the world differently though and you're, you're going for that. So that's really beautiful. And thank you for sharing that because I know that, that you feel a little more like your faith is is coming stronger by being able to talk about this. So I find so I I'm it's the experience. It's it's not the words, it's it's the knowing inside, the feeling inside that you know you're on the right track. Um Stephen has now said he's going to go away for a while to Vietnam and I'm worried about that and then I come back to the mind again thinking I have to let go of that worry I have to leave that to spirit and spirit is telling me as I get stronger in the spirit and Stephen gets weaker then I'll be able to to to, to let him know how what I've done beautiful Thank you. We can feel your steadfastness of hanging in there with us and, and working with the Spirit. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. And then I just uh, was looking at our uh, list again. You know, um, Rich 
Rich Lisp is a, a, from out there in California. You know, Rich has, has had a lesson with the car, and and Rich wrote to me uh, right when this happened, and I thought I would share it because because I've had a lot of car lessons. You know, the spirit works with us with with what we have in this world and what we value, and then helps loosen us from these values and. Uh, I'll just read what Rich wrote and I'll share a little bit about some, some of the car lessons I've had too. Rich writes, a couple of days ago, my automobile was stolen while I just finished paying all the payments on a five-year loan. After the initial shock, a couple seconds of denial, I knew immediately to go into forgiveness mode. We often say everything is always working out. The script is written. Forgiveness is a gift to yourself, and nothing is worth giving up my peace of mind, etc. I feel pretty good. No anger, no stress, feeling relaxed about the whole thing, peaceful. What I do not know is, am I really doing that, or am I in denial of my feelings? Am I spiritually bypassing? I really do not know if that is the case. Wondering if you all have anything to say about that? Any guidance that comes up? I am open to your guidance. Thanks. Love, 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 always. And um, the important thing for me to remember is, okay, I'm perceiving a world and then things happen in this world and then I, I pay close attention to my feelings. Um, like you said, probably there was initial shock, like, what? Like, what, what is this? And, and I certainly can relate to that because I, I know that um, for me, in my parable of David, having a car was no small thing. In fact, I, I wanted to have a nice car. Oftentimes in, my, in college years, I wanted a certain kind of car. Uh, I, I could see in retrospect that the car was pretty important part of, I would call it the self-concept of David. So, uh, and then you give your life over to Jesus and you say, oh, I want to heal, I want to be used in the plan of awakening, I want to forgive, I want to wake up. And uh, I know in, in university, uh, it took me quite a while, but the first car that I owned at that point on my own, I bought a Cougar XR7, a Mercury Cougar XR7 with the, with the turn signal lights that went, you know, on the back. I, when I was growing up, I'm like, I'd be going to church or whatever, my parents and I'd go, would you look at the turn signals on that car? My God, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And so when I finally got to purchase my own car, it was a Cougar XR7. And, and I remember going to, the, to the, run the air as I went, to a bank one time to make a deposit. And I came out and some guy was just standing there looking at my car. And he said, that is the coolest car. And if you ever want to sell that car, man, that is the coolest car I have ever seen. And I'm thinking, yeah, that is the coolest car I've ever seen. And, and see, at this time, you know, it's all self-concept, but you don't know any different. You think, I finally got the car that I wanted. It's, I, so at one point I was at the University of Cincinnati and uh, I was taking some friends down to get some art supplies in downtown Cincinnati. I was just sitting at a, a, a red light uh, waiting because there was a car too in front of me and, and a car came from behind me at a high speed. It looked like a bullet. And he was like looking, watching the kids in the park or something, plowed into the back of my Cougar XR7. Oh, those turn signal lights, uh, they were crushed and demolished in one instant. And the whole car, the frame was bent and it, well, I remember I was like, well, maybe I'll get something from the insurance. No, it was hardly any insurance money. The most I could buy was a yellow AMC Gremlin. That's what Jesus put me in after a Cougar XR7. It was like a Gremlin with these little stripes on the side. And I remember, I think a friend of mine one time just came to me and he went, that car you got there, it's ugly. It's just plain old <laughs> ugly. You go dropping off, this is how Jesus works. You drop off from a Cougar XR7, kind of a, 
a brownish, you know, really cool color. And then you go to a yellow a gremlin. It looks like it's got sideburns or something on these stripes. And, and uh, this is the way it went. And then, of course, you know the story, Rich, you know, when I was on my tour with Jesus down in 1992, the, the, a friend of mine, and we were using her car, and she was like, she was saying a little concerned about her car on the trip. And I said, well, you know, Jesus will just use the car. I don't think I had told her all my Jesus parables already. She probably wouldn't even let me get in the car. But we went out for a walk along the ocean and we came back and the car was gone. And that got used as a way to strengthen my faith that everything would be taken care of. And amazing miracles happened around that. And so I think the main thing is, is to come to a sense of a great allowance and permission with your feelings. Like after that initial shock, you, you have to use it for, for the healing of your mind, uh, to let the emotions come up. Like uh, I've had that happen a few times too, where I've had no car. And then I notice, how do I feel? I feel constrained. I feel like it's a loss of my personal freedom. You know, I would let all those emotions come up. Uh, and then I've had more miracle stories too, where I actually had a, like a, a yard sale car that came in for like $100, very miraculously. It took me to Roscoe and Ken and Gloria Wapnick's place. Uh, uh, so I've had a bunch of car experiences, but I think your question is, is a little bit more like Jerry's. You're just wanting to really be in touch with those feelings, whatever they are. Uh, and how has it been going for you? I mean, it's been a little while since, since it happened, but how have been uh, those emotions for you when you really just kind of let them, let them stream up? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rich. <laughs> That's the first thing I want to say is how much I love what you're doing. Uh, yeah, it's gone. You know, after I wrote that, that was probably the worst point of the whole situation was when I wrote that, and I wasn't feeling that bad. So not long after that, they found the car. I, I didn't know if they were going to find the car, if they broke it up into pieces or what, but they didn't. They, they found the car, um, um, and I didn't even know until the insurance agent called me, the police had called me, but they have an unknown number. And I wasn't even checking, you know? And uh, the insurance company called me, and so I went down. And you know, when you go to a tow company, you're thinking, oh, those people aren't very nice. They're gonna be rough with me. And no, they were great. They, you know, I, before I got there, I'm, I'm, you know, I went in prayer and I said, you know, I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I'm content wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me and I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. And, you know, I really felt that. And if the towing agency, I met the nicest gal that you could ever ask for. Everybody was sweet. The police, the sheriff was sweet. Everything mm -hmm. worked out great. And now even the insurance agent said, where, where should we fix your car? Mm -hmm. oh, wherever you want, you know, it's okay with me. She goes, no, 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 no. We'll make it easy for you. We'll put it right by your house, mm -hmm. it, it, you know? So it's, it's right down the street and they're a super, great facility and it's going to be worked out great but the most important thing for me wasn't even the car it was how did I do it? what what were my emotions um and everybody around me my son and his mother and my friends were you know that's a violation this is the worst thing that could ever happen and I knew thanks to you David and all your guidance that you know that's not it it's it's, it's just a, it's a car. And I would say that that was a good symbol, you know, that material things aren't so important. It's really 
are relationships with people that really bring more up. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's a witness for all of us. Because that could seem to be a major thing, but you just, you, you were carried along with such grace with all that, that practice and purpose thanks, there. Thanks to you, Dave. <laughs> well, we definitely got some car parables to share now <laughs> as we go along. Some, the Jesus knows how to use us. He knows what to do with us. Okay, well, let me see. Um, let's go to something here, too, that involves a bit, little bit of uh, the body and the body image. This is from Catherine Madison in South Africa. And she writes, Hi, David. I am sending this after almost a year of wanting to with the real desire to change my mind about what I am, to let go of this intense disliking of myself, and to accept that I am not a body, in spite of being so heavily invested in it. I want to accept the truth of who I am. I have been bulimic for 22 years. I have an intense fear that if my body gets bigger, I will be rejected. The Course makes it clear that trying to change the form is impossible, that a change of mind is needed. So I've stopped trying to stop myself and I just go with it, most of the time asking Holy Spirit to help me to see it differently. I am seeming to be using a combination of food and the practical application of the Course as best I can to deal with loneliness, rage, and an uninspired life. I have such a deep desire for healing, yet my binging and purging would say otherwise. I feel so unlovable and I long for the experience of knowing I am love. I am open to anything that you have to share and have so much gratitude for all that you are and all that you share. Much love. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for just pouring your heart out. You know, that is the, f the first step is when we pour our heart out, then suddenly it's, it doesn't seem so much like it's our individual problem because it, you can, we can start to feel with these online retreats that all of us are dealing with these beliefs and these thoughts of who we are and of our worth. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that feeling of of feeling uh, unlovable because that's that's probably our greatest block to accepting the holy instant. You know, the holy instant for most of us, it when we were growing up, we didn't we weren't aware that there was a holy instant. <laughs> you know, that that there was this moment of innocence that would just show us the love and light that we always have been because we've been so caught up in the mesmerism of this world, achievements. What have you done lately with me? And of course, you heard me talking yesterday. I was mentioning Oprah Winfrey and, uh, and all of her issues around, uh, about, around her weight and her body image. Um, you know, she was so transparent. And I just see that, that by her being transparent and just bringing these thoughts into a dialogue where she could actually start to say, here's what I'm dealing with on a daily basis, that suddenly there was lots of men and women who watched her show that suddenly felt like they weren't so alone, that they were dealing with the same thing. It wasn't just a personal hell, it was more of like a, 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 a driven experience around uh, worth, uh, self-worth in the body. And uh, so, very much like with, with uh, Jerry and Rich and the, and the ones we just talked about, you know, allowing yourself to talk about these things, allowing yourself to, to bring these up into awareness is the first step in healing. Just like for Oprah, that was huge for her to do what she did on television in front of a national and a, really a worldwide audience. You know, she she sent a tidal wave of healing, I think, uh, f f really around the world by being a witness and a demonstration. And what's coming to mind from the Course is that, that from 
our ego belief system, the ego sees the body as, as an end and not as a means. So we, you know, we pretty much, when we buy into that, it puts a lot of pressure on our mind in terms of the right size, the right shape, what's, what's acceptable, what's attractive, uh, because a lot of these ego stories and fantasies are all these fantasies of love are very, very much around the body. The body is like the central figure, uh, the hero in the dream or the hero in, in, the, in the dream where it goes through all these serial adventures and that's what all the romance novels are about. That's what a lot of these fairy tales that we grew up with are about. That's what these movies many of the movies we watch are all sending the same message that the body is all important and that you have to look a certain way to be lovable. And uh, that message is so deeply ingrained, it's so programmed and reprogrammed and reinforced over and over and over that it does feel like a, a prison, a prison sentence or it seems like, a, like there's, you're trapped in in a, a cell of the mind that is put all this focus and, and attention on the body. It's almost like displacing from your Christ identity, your God-given identity, and projecting all this pressure onto this uh, body. And for me and for the ones that I've lived with and worked with, the turnaround comes is that we are seeing, no, the body's just an instrument to be used by the Spirit as a communication device and to start to gain, uh, to gain a confidence in allowing that to occur. Because this particular year, 2018, I remember I was down in Mexico and uh, I was praying and uh, suddenly I heard from Jesus, he said, uh, you've got to get the people in the community really extending they need to share my message. They need to shine this light. They need to allow themselves to be used as instruments for me. So I remember I, I called somebody, I sent out an email, I said, we're going to start some, some TV shows. We're doing TV shows. We're going to have these, and who's going to, who's going to do them? You, and you, and you, and you, and you. <laughs> and Jeffrey's right behind me here. Jeffrey's like the director. We got directors, producers, cameramen, and then people went out there a little bit, a little bit frightened to say the least to do these shows, but now they're getting really comfortable <laughs> being, letting the Holy Spirit use their body as a communication device for the light, for the love and the joy. I mean, we flipped it pretty quick. I remember, I think it was late February where I was saying, we need to do this, and then at the beginning of March, Lisa had a talk with everybody, said, come on, we're really going to do this. Like, we're not just joking about this. And then there was a trepidation and some fear about doing this. And, and yet, before you knew it, then they're all starting to get as relaxed as Jeff. Look at Jeff. He's the most relaxed guy on the planet. He's sitting up on a mountain in Peru and having a ball up there. <laughs> it's like, and broadcasting and beaming. <laughs> all over the place. And people started to get relaxed more like that, like really enjoy it, like savor it. Like say, oh my gosh, this is my calling. This is, this is the use for my body that I've always felt would be, would be helpful. And yet it was, it was out of our minds. None of us uh, really saw any of this coming. But I, I'm just telling you this, Catherine, because I, I really feel like that's the key the more we start to allow it to be used, the body to be used in, in this way, in this transparency, I can just feel the love, the love cords start going in our hearts stronger and stronger and stronger. And, and I have such faith in you. I know uh, that you're going to be able to do this because I, I have the same faith in you that I had about these, these friends that I live with. You know, I, I had no doubt they they would be able to do it. And, and interestingly enough, even the ones that took maybe six or seven weeks to start to loosen up, they did finally loosen up with a smile. You know, they did finally say, oh, I can do this. And 
I just, I love your transparency though, because there's a lot of people that are dealing with these kind of issues that are very intense, and yet the first step is, is always in, uh, in, in opening up like you did, and, and, and we all share the blessings. You can share a bit. How, how has this uh, retreat been for you? No. Try. Right. Here we go. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So this retreat was a a very big commitment for me, because I always had a thousand reasons why I couldn't wake up at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> to tune in on Friday because <laughs> sleep is a, a big thing. And, and anyway, I just really felt a calling um, to join. So it's, it's really been a weekend of, of devotion. I've turned off my phone. Mm -hmm. I've really just tried to be present. And I think the thing that you touched on, David, was so um, important, and I get it. When you're in your function, then the need to go into obsessive behaviors is like eliminated. And that's my biggest um, like calling. I, I, I'm like dying to know what my function is. And I'm like, like, I'm not hearing it. And I find work to be completely uninspiring. It's it's like, it's such a massive distraction because there's so much thinking and analyzing and, and management involved. I'm, I'm a manager of a team of people. And I just, I just, I'm like, I don't think this is it. <laughs> so, like, I'm open, but can you just speak louder? <laughs> you know, so, and, and then when I'm in that joy, then I don't, I don't feel like I need to binge and purge. You know, it's the furthest thing from my mind, but when I just feel so, like, mm -hmm. uninspired and living this, like, Groundhog Day, you know, then, then mm -hmm. the food becomes like excitement, which just sounds so terribly pathetic, but that's yeah. really what happens, you know, like this little twinkle in my life. And I'd rather have a better <laughs> twinkle, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I just, yeah. just to find that function, like how do you find it? I feel like you're down there in South Africa and, and just your connections with us and with this community is part of the inroads. Like, like I think for all of us, we need, we need first of all some examples and some demonstrations that beyond your nine to five and, and the routines that, that many of us uh, and me, most people in the world uh, have have very strong rituals around work and career. They find themselves doing jobs uh, that they think are pretty bizarre. They they will sometimes in the middle of the day they'll say, "How did I even get into this crazy grind? Uh, where where did it start? Uh, how did I get into it?" And managing people, yeah, that's that'll drive you. Uh, either insane or it will drive you inward inward to sanity in a in a hurry because the mind has only so much tolerance for um, for conflict at some point um, it's it's almost like okay there's got to be something else beyond this and then when you start to see witnesses of people that have felt that calling that have felt blocked from guidance but nevertheless persisted you start talking to these people who have taken some of these, I call them unwinding steps, because for most people they're given a more slowly evolving curriculum. I've said like Eckhart Tolle on the park bench, it's very rare that it happens that dramatic and that quick. For most it's, it's an unwind, it's a little more, it's a little more. And it just helps that you're in communication now because the more we share our parables, the more we share what we've gone through together. It starts to build a momentum of people. Uh, I mean, I could go through some of the people I live with. Uh, um, the, there are different circumstances where 
where they seem to start out, but they, in some ways, whether it was through uh, career and job, whether it was through family, whether it was through addiction, whatever, they they felt very trapped, and then they they felt a little flicker of hope, uh, light coming into that dark, trapped, repetitive, ritualistic experience, and then they just followed that little trickle of light until they could start to wiggle themselves loose in their mind from some of those things. So I'm really enjoying, uh, yeah, getting to see you and, and communicate with you like this. And also, I feel like that all of us are, are being benefited from this because uh, uh, Bridget talked about that too, going to work, coming home, feeling depressed. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a common experience and yet we're all on the, the path of starting to break free from that and really come come closer to the holy instant and, and feel our innocence. So, thank you. Thank you for being here with us and thank you for getting up last, last night at, at all hours of the of the day to join in with sleep. Thank with sleep. you. Thank you. And thanks for everything, David. Uh, mm -hmm. You're just, yeah, been so helpful and so inspiring. So mm -hmm. I like I have so much gratitude for everything that you do and and everyone at Living Miracles. So beautiful. Just want to say that you are. Thanks. Very good. Well, I I did visit South Africa and um, had a blast going around the country. Uh, to s some of the major cities and, and in the rural areas. And uh, so you're in our hearts. We've got a, a website down there and, and we, we think of that a lot. So it, the, the digital is good for us now, but we'll keep that in mind. In fact, you're just, you're right on the way. I always say right on the way to the South Pole, except I never, <laughs> I never made it to the South Pole. But, but it's, I did make it though. I made it once. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, Jeff, how are we looking? Is there anybody else with their hand up? Yeah, we have a number of people. Mm -hmm. uh, next would be um, Michael Graves. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I was just sitting here thinking after I raised my hand, it's not a raise my hand that I'm going to talk button, it's a I'm willing to share button, depending on how things go. And I'm sitting here doing all this mental work with that. It's really great. Um, I, I just have this uh, thing that's kind of happened in my life around my relationship with my wife. I retired about six and a half years ago. And when I did that, I, I conscious decision to go deeper into my study of A Course in Miracles because when I was working I was you know doing the best I can like I hear a lot of people saying and and uh, it can be difficult in a distraction but once that space opened up and there's a miraculous story about how I left my job too I was kind of let out of that place and it was so funny to me but um, once that space was created uh, and I started my study of A Course in Miracles and, and, and began um, my interactions with the Living Miracles communities and, and other you know, um, things. Uh, there was a really a big concern that started to come up for both of my wife and I both. That at some point there was going to be this leading um, of me away because she could see the obvious, you know, devotion. I'm one of those people that kind of tend to put my head down and head in certain directions. Not that that's a good thing, but uh, and so there's kind of this concern about what this was going to mean for our relationship. And while she's very supportive. Uh, of everything that I've done, that there was this concern and we would talk about it from time to time. And I would tell her, you know, I'm as concerned as you are about this. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, I have this fear too. So it's, it had been present for a long time. And uh, Sarah, when she was here, we addressed it a little bit and, and she kind of pointed out some things that were very helpful for me. Um, but she also gave me some um, input saying, you know, I see a very, you know, solid foundation. My wife is not a Course in Miracles student, but we share, a lot of um, uh, the love for the principles, you know, so it's really not so much about, you know, what, where it comes from, but we both are very, really quite aligned in that way. But what I want to talk about is how um, just recently, um, you know, I've been, you know, this concern about, you know, wanting to be, you know, with and in relationship with the mighty companion. 
And I just kind of kept, uh, you know, we started integrating, you know, the no private thoughts and we started working on our communication and being more open. And that was really very helpful. But what came to me recently was, um, is, you know, Jesus very clearly told me, you know, she is your mighty companion. We would sit and talk and, and, and I interact with many other mighty companions. Hey, everybody, most of a lot of you guys are here today and I, I've interacted with you guys. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same thing. I get the same clarity, the same uh, beauty, the same washing away of some of the uh, blocks and, and, the, and the, the coming together and the closeness that um, has resulted from some of that. And so we had that talk the other day and I said, you know, I've really realized that you are my mighty companion and it doesn't matter that you don't study A Course in Miracles, and, but you're very committed to the principles of truth like I am. And so those differences, you know, are really non-existent. Um, uh, they're just you know forms that we're both just really um letting go of and and uh, i became an ordained minister um uh, you know i don't know a couple of years after i retired and and she would talk about my ministry and how i work with people and, and different things mostly in 12-step programs and things like that but i do some other relationships counseling with, with people that i've met and just you know help them and of course you know the course of miracles principles filter in it's kind of hard not to do that but, um, and it's, it's very well received, but I, I would always tell her how, you know, she has a ministry too with the way she talks about how she is at work and what she does at work and how really it, it is so little about a job and earning money and so much about who she's with and, and the, 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 the holy encounters that she has on just, I mean, a moment by moment basis where she is. So it, it's just been this, um, lifting of this concept that there has to be some structure or form to it in order for it to be holy or in order for it to be um, advancing you know all of us and and the people around us and there's so many people that are affected by our relationship and how beautiful that they see it is we just celebrated 14 years and and um you know it's my third marriage you know so 14 years in the third marriage that's pretty good and, and i met her in a 12-step program so there was some foundation there to work with but it's just been so beautiful to see Jesus use it. And, and I always could see that part of it. But the, what this did is it washed away that fear that was there about, you know, there could be a leading away. And, you know, even when I went to Strawberry, there was this little uh, kind of, we were kind of joking. Um, and this is before we came to the Mighty Companion talk that we really shared that with each other. That um, She goes, yeah, I'm sure I'll get a Dear John text or something from Strawberry. I'm, you know, I've met so-and-so and we're going to run off together. Or maybe I'm going to stay in Utah and, you know, it was fun, but, you know, I got to do this and all this kind of stuff. And, it, but, you know, it was kind of half funny and kind of half not. Um, but, you know, obviously that didn't take place. Although there were some beautiful things that took place there and I can't, you know, wait for the next one. But uh, it's just all that's been washed away. And I just wanted to, because I'm sure there's other people out there. I, I think I heard Walter talking about that a little bit in his mystery school experience and and, and how beautiful it was that, you know, there wasn't a lot of focus on that particular part of it, but boy, it sure resonated with me. And I just wanted to share what, what I've been through with that. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And thank you to you, David, and the Living Miracles community and all of my mighty companions, oh. those of you that are watching and those of you that are not, you know, we're all connected and yeah. I feel that every day. So thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Wow, we feel your heart. You're, we feel it. It's so beautiful. Okay, Jeff, do we have anyone else? We do. Um, Jean. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, this happened last time, too. I thought I was off the hook in the very last minute. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I'll try to be... Um, so I... What Catherine was talking about spoke to me a lot um, in that I, I feel like I'm just kind of waiting for a purpose or function or message or guidance. And I also feel guilty because my life has rearranged itself this year where I actually have time. I have no money, but I have time. I could be meditating all day long or not. I'm really, I guess I do judge myself right out of it, but I, I also love it that I'm not going to work every day and I watch four or five movie watcher guide movies a day, but I'm not doing lessons. I'm not praying. I'm not, 
Um, I got inspired watching the the silence movies with Jeff, but next day turned on the movies and <laughs> I'm just I, I'm feeling kind of zombie zombie like as well. But I have no excuse. I I I could be full on, but I feel like I'm just waiting, and I'm I. I keep hope. I don't know. Should I be like, is there some discipline required here to say, okay, get up and do an hour of silence or something? Because I'm kind of just letting everything completely happen and nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah, Jean, yeah, that's pretty, it's pretty common sometimes when we've had very busy and hectic lives that were really full schedule and we, we had different projects and things going on. Then we reached kind of more of like a lull where there's a, a spaciousness. And, and I know for myself and a, a lot of people I talk to, that's the, it's almost like the temptation. Then when there's so much spaciousness, then we're like watching our mind and, and going, now should I be doing more? You know, that's almost like the, the, the question that's lingering in there. And you know, A Course in Miracles is a, is a pathway of relationships, using relationships, unlike a lot of traditional spiritualities, but I think there, there are always kind of exciting ways to, to connect. I mean, I, I watched a lot of movies when I had a lot of spaciousness too. I, I would say, okay, Jesus, take me to the movies and go rent movies, or back in the day, go, go to the theater for the matinee and, and maybe another afternoon movie and they say, okay, what's in it for me? And, but I feel like that, uh, that the course is a pathway where there's a lot of preparation that goes on, but it's really the spirits working with your motivation. And, and I think it's helpful to think about that really it's, you have to offer your willingness to have your motivation expanded or increased. It's almost like I tell people, put it on the spirit. It's the spirit's job to convince you. You're not mm -hmm. to, here to convince anybody or even to convince yourself. It's the spirit's job to convince you. So I would say that to Jesus. I'd say, okay, convince me. And he'd say, okay, come to the movies with me and listen to these songs and all kinds of things. He'd work with me on the golf course because I, he knew I liked to play golf. He worked with me on the tennis court because he, he knew I liked to play tennis. He didn't really have me learning a bunch of new stuff. He just took, he knew what my ego preferences were and he was like, ah, oh, we can work with that. We can work with that. You know, it's almost like I'll, I'll meet you halfway. I'll meet you with the things that you still like. Uh, there were times too where I would just have holy encounters with people. I meet them for lunch and we'd have these long, deep conversations. There were other times in my life where when Skype came along or these uh, higher tech, these new technologies, I'd say, well, this is fantastic. It's almost like we're in the same room and we would have these great connections and talk about what really was meaningful. I called them heart to heart uh, conversations. And I do feel like even there were years where I just was having bunches and bunches of heart to heart conversations where it didn't look like spiritual community or it didn't look like I was productive. People were like, you're just going out and having a bunch of lunches. Uh, that's all you're doing. And I'd say, it feels great though. I mean, it's <laughs> my heart is opening up. It feels great, but it didn't fit into boxes. You know, you know, are you doing yoga? Are you doing, you know, are you disciplining your mind? I was following the joy like Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. So I think it's helpful to, to just, when you have that spacious, maybe take a little bit of an inventory or journal about some of the things that you are drawn to, that you find exciting, uh, that they don't have to fit in any kind of a box because it's the ego tendency to, to be, try to be self-critical or to always think we should be doing more or, um, to try to fit into some kind of a of a spiritual self concept, um, which you know in the end is is another concept anyway. <laughs> we have to we have to let go of them all anyway. So the spirit it, just ask the spirit to be in charge, and and I do feel like just with your journey, 
uh, as you want to be used by the Spirit, you start to refine things, you start to notice things, things that you're more drawn to, things that you're not so drawn to, you can start to let some of those other things just drop away. You know, it, it's okay to, to have the Spirit clear your plate and then oftentimes when the Spirit would kind of clear my plate and I would be astonished, like I can't believe all the space I have now, then oftentimes that's when new things would drop in because I actually had space in my life for them to drop in. And there were some amazing things that, uh, that dropped in. And, and don't be hard on yourself because it's like the Spirit's got to draw your motivation higher and higher. Uh, it's not for you to try to critique that or judge that, you know, just to, uh, just to hang in there with it. And yeah, just so great that we're able to connect in this way because it, uh, you know, it takes away some of those press, pressures and stresses of trying to like fit into some kind of a spiritual spiritual box or something. You don't really have to do that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Beautiful. Jeff, do we have anybody else? We do. We have a couple of hands up. Um, Sabina, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, good evening from uh, Europe. Hi, all my friends. I met at Strawberry and in my um, online your mind group too. Um, okay, so many of the things which have already been said were very very interesting to me too. Um, especially which was the things which were said by Jan because I I am too now very free. I retired a couple of weeks ago and now I'm trying to find out how my new life will be like. Um, and um, I found out it's perhaps a little bit too much to think about a special thing. I like to approach people. I like to go outside and just speak to people in the street. And then we have a conversation and it may be in the gym or it may be somewhere in the train or public transport, anywhere. And so, um, yeah, I think this is joyful for me and perhaps I can bring joy to people in this way. I was always thinking it must be spiritual. We have to have deep conversations about God or spirituality. And then it turned out most people are not interested and then we are just having a normal conversation. But I can perhaps still be helpful also having a nice and joyful conversation about anything and still um, and still fulfilling my function. So this is something perhaps which I'm not very sure about, which I want to ask you, but perhaps which could be helpful to other people too. And then I'm always very interested in the practical application of the course. And I would like to come back to the rules for decision because I'm not quite sure if decision means also planning. And so, um, if I wake up in the morning, for example, to be very specific, and I tell myself today, today I will not make, um, I will make no decision by myself, and then I imagine or picture my day, what it will be like. Perhaps mostly it must be happy and funny and something like this. But there must also be some planning, and planning is also decision making. So, for example, do I go out? Um, very sim putting it very simply, do I want to go to the gym or do I want to phone a friend or whatever? Is this a decision based based on a on um, on an unconscious belief or what is it? So this is a very practical thing I would like to ask you. Then I have more practical questions. Perhaps I bring them up right now, <laughs> and just okay. um, I'm just at the beginning. Do you want to answer this or yeah, I go on? Let's work on that first one. That's a good one. How does, yeah. how does planning uh, fit into the rules for decision? Well, for most human beings, planning is, is a pretty big part of their life uh, and their life experiences. Um, if, in fact, if somebody just said, I'm just going to pull planning out of your life experiences, it would be very uh, disorienting for most people because it's such a big part. And the, the Course uh, 
Jesus does address this uh, in lesson 135, uh, where basically he says, if there are plans to be made, you will be told of them. So, so the guidance of, of the spirit uh, works with what the mind believes in. And if the mind believes in, in time and plans, which is, is quite common, uh, the spirit will use those plans. It will direct those plans for the unwinding of the mind. Uh, a lot of times people think of if you're in, in the present moment, you wouldn't have any plans whatsoever. But that's really talking of like the, the far, far, far advanced, you know, that's getting into the, the mystics and, the, and the, uh, the, the gurus that have gone into these deep mystical states of predominantly meditation. And they can get into these uh, states of mind where planning disappears. But actually for most people, it's quite practical to have the Spirit uh, give you plans. For example, for myself, um, I remember about 2006, I was asked to, uh, to uh, participate in a, a National Course in Miracles conference in San Francisco. And I just prayed and uh, the Spirit said, yep, I want you to be at that conference uh, a year from now. <laughs> Uh, in San Francisco at the Holiday Inn. And uh, so I went and I did it. And then they started to do a conference like every two years. So as soon as I finished the conference, uh, a few weeks or months go by, I get an email, will you commit to the two, it was two years in advance? And this went on, I was at two, 2007, 2009, 2011. There was a few years where we actually did it every year, but most years it was a, it was a two year plan that the Spirit just had me sharing at these big National Course in Miracles conferences. It was almost like a family reunion, meeting people that I'd been seen from the road and corresponded with, and we would just come together and rejoice, almost like a, a family reunion that was based on A Course in Miracles. So, yeah, I think that's the answer to your first question is that as you tune in more and more to guidance, you can, you can definitely have a plan, whether it's during the day or even a year or two years in advance, if it comes in very strong, uh, that's, that's part of your uh, function. That's part of uh, Spirit giving you uh, something that will be a blessing for the whole universe. And, and that, that, that occurs, that will continue to occur until you start to get into like these samadhi state of minds <laughs> where you don't even know what a plan is, you know, when you get into those. But, but until then, yeah, be ready for those, those plans to come in from the Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is another practical question, but I think we are running out of time. So I have another one which goes very deep, which is my love to... My, my loving of God, this goes really very deep because yesterday um, I was sent this, this wonderful book, Absence from Felicity. Yes, I know. Um, I ordered it a couple of months ago and I forgot about it. And then I started reading it. And um, while I was reading the first pages or the first chapters, I was so impressed and struck by um, Helen's tribulations and her, how she was fighting and struggling to, to have a relationship to God. Uh, then she doubted and had faith and trust. Yes. And then it came to my awareness, what do I think about God? And I, I, I didn't think that I really, really love him. And I don't have a sense of what is it to love God? What, what is it? What does it feel like? I would so much like, love God, but I was told when I was a child, love God. I was brought up like many people in Christianity and my mother had a very deep faith. And you have to think, you have to love God and then everything, uh, every, all your problems are being solved. I, I have never a clue what, what she was talking about. But now I would like to know, but to be honest, I don't know yet. So I, is there anything I could do? I mean, reading this book is great. It's really a great book I could recommend to anybody. 
It's Thank you. I think this it is, is yeah. it's beautiful. It is a great book. And I would the one thing that's coming to mind is is that God has no definitions. And so where people have difficulty and the struggle and the challenge comes in is it's the same with love. You know, it's it's so, it's an experience that Jesus even says uh, this course does not attempt to teach the aim at teaching the meaning of love for that is far beyond what can be taught. And you could say the same with God. This course doesn't aim at teaching the meaning of God, for that is far beyond what could be taught. But it does aim at removing the obstacles. So what you're doing through your daily practices of those exciting conversations with people in your city, from your reading Absence from Felicity, and, and how you're, you're just beginning to use this retirement, you're giving a retirement over to the Spirit and saying, I don't know what this is. I have no clue. You show me. That's all good, good, good. And then w when you th think of God, just, just try to release all definitions because it's a, it's a state of being, it's a state of mind that is not defined in the least bit. There is absolutely no way of defining God or love. And yet we all know that we have these experiences that burst forth through us and that they're so amazing that they get our attention and just allow that to happen. Allow yourself to be taken more and more towards those. Because really that's this whole, uh, this whole weekend about the holy instant, the breath of eternity, we're, we're so much aiming for an expansive experience and and as we're getting down to our final few minutes, uh, the Spirit's reminding me again that uh, but Jason and Francis have been have worked on and, and prepared these set of clips that I mentioned yesterday that are just mind-expanding clips. Uh, we've had a, a beautiful morning of, here of chatting and talking and sharing of the hearts, but now get ready for some music. Uh, get ready for some to have your mind blown with some clips. Uh, you know, that's the joy of just stepping into an experience. And that I really hear that's what you're calling for. You know, you're just, you, it's all new for you. You have some spaciousness now with retirement and, and uh, savor that book too. That's going to be a, a really a, a spectacular experience as well. And for all of you, it's, it's down, we're down to our last couple minutes here. I just want to invite you uh, to rest, go to the restroom, uh, the bathroom, maybe have something to eat. Just give yourself a little spaciousness here uh, for our next segment because um, I know it's going to be a spectacular uh, segment. And this is the first time ever where I've done a, a retreat where I'm, I'm going to leave in a few minutes and hop on an airplane and, and I may end up rejoining you from another country. Uh, my, my online retreat is being split up <laughs> into different countries and a different time zone. And so it's new for me. I've never done it. Uh, I've got, I've got to throw on a jacket and, and get whisked away. Kirsten's driving Svava and I, uh, to the airport, but stay tuned. Uh, you're, you don't want to miss this next segment because <laughs> I've seen some of these clips and I, I can tell you it's going to be quite a, a treat. So, Jeff, I think um, we're down to the final minute. We'll, we'll go back to you, and uh, you can, can take us home here. And uh, I love you all, and uh, I hope to see you real soon, maybe from a different country, but I'm with you. 